There we go. Yeah, we had a leak. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We were in backstage, uh, just transitioned over. Um, so thank you for being patient with us. I'm uh, Amy Soloznoff with the Madera Chachula Resource Conservation District. Just wanna welcome you all today to the Nitricity Climate Smart webinar. And I will pass it over to Tiziano with Nitricity. Thank you so much, Amy, for the introduction. My name is Tiziano Celli and I am agronomist at Nitricity. Uh, I joined the team about nine months ago and I will be, uh, I'm very excited to share with you uh, our Climate Smart Fertilizer. And I will pass uh, the microphone to Silas. Hey everyone, Silas Rosso here in Madera, California. Um, I own and operate California Ag Solutions. Uh, we're a business focused on uh, mainly regenerative ag practices as well as soil health and just trying to get plant nutrition balanced. So it's been a lot of fun working in this industry and I look forward to uh, just talking about some of the nitrogen cycles and some of the other things that we see on a pretty common daily basis that affect the nitrogen cycle. So I will hand it off to Zach. Silas, I'm Zach Ellis, Senior Director of Agronomy. I've been working with Olam Food Ingredients for eight years now. We manage uh, mostly almonds from Bakersfield all the way up to Modesto. I'm also concurrently getting my PhD at UC Davis. So I get to work with all the uh, really best and bright uh, researchers and, and professors in the industry and, and try to bring that uh, from a grower perspective to, to more actionable items in the field. Happy to be here. Thank you, Zach. And thank you everybody for the introduction. Now we could begin the presentation from Tiziano with Nitricity. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So again, thank everybody for uh, you know uh, joining me today in the, in the, my part of the webinar. I will be speaking about climate smart fertilizer and uh, how the disruptive approach of nitricity, uh, you know, we, how we want to feed the world with uh, lightning. So um, today I will be speaking about um, first and foremost about the environmental impact of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, it's uh, you know a very important problem for uh, our future and something that in electricity we want to address. Then I will be speaking about how nitricity uh, want to tackle this issue. So I will be speaking about our technology. I will be moving on to speaking about the benefits of calcium nitrate. And um, then I will be launching a brief survey uh, of a couple of questions to ask you, you know, what you know and uh, what, uh, what was presented today about calcium nitrate, how that uh, can integrate in your current practices. And uh, then I will be showing you what's next in Nitricity's future. So let's start with uh, addressing the problem. So addressing the environmental impact of nitrogen fertilizers. Nitrogen fertilizers are constituting a big impact uh, on, uh, on the world because uh, they represent between five and 7% of the total greenhouse gas emission. Uh, you know, which if we think about that is a very significant percentage. Uh, it's estimated for, that for each pound of nitrogen that we apply in the field, uh, between two to four pounds of uh, CO2 are emitted. And that's obviously a very important problem that, uh, uh, you know, we want to tackle. The problems are related to both uh, production of nitrogen fertilizer, as well as the uh, distribution and application. The production of fertilizers uh, takes place in about 200 hubs around the world, and then the fertilizers are distributed, uh, you know, in the fields, in, in our fields. So, you know, it, it's a very, it's a significant impact uh, for the large scale distribution. And finally, from an application perspective, um, we know that application of fertilizers is uh, fairly inefficient. It's estimated that the average global nitrogen use efficiency is between 30 and 50% that uh, tells us that between 70 and 50% of, of the nitrogen fertilizers are, uh, you know, are lost in the field. And the loss mechanism are various. Uh, we can go from nitrate leaching, runoff, volatilization, um, and N2 emissions. Specifically, the N2 emissions are uh, a significant problem because uh, it's a gas that is emitted in very small quantities, but can last in the atmosphere for a very long time. So in Nitricity, I will be showing you later, but uh, you know, 
we are doing some studies about that and it will be exciting to show you the results. So let's move on on how Nitricity is tackling this problem. Uh, Nitricity is um, a startup company based in Fremont, California, and was found by two Stanford PhD um, former students as well as one postdoc uh, still in Stanford. And Nitricity is having a very ambitious mission in tackling uh, the decrease of these five to 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions as well as building, building an independent supply, uh, so cutting uh, the distribution phase of the fertilizers. And now we are planning to do that is to work with uh, our uh, climate smart fertilizers. Um, the fertilizer production in electricity is uh, electrified. That means that we can use electric clean energy to produce nitrogen fertilizers that we, we will need uh, as input in agriculture. It's a distributed production, so we can have few hubs, uh, you know, localized in the field or close to the fields where we can produce nitrogen fertilizer. And the fertilizer are optimized, uh, but are optimized for our fields and uh, us as farmers, not as, uh, you know, for the logistic companies, for instance. Uh, so... Our technology is uh, based on natural process. So we are simulating the process of, of lightning, but you know, we can contain this process. So sometimes after a storm, you can see that, uh, you know, the grass is growing greener for the couple of days that are following it. And the reason why is that um, lightning are uh, a form of plasma, which is something that we are replicating in a small scale. And the rain, in our case, uh, you know, water containing absorption column, can um, you know can um, trap this uh, nitric molecule forming nitric acid, and then we can neutralize this uh, nitric acid form with limestone or other material, providing the final uh, uh, output as uh, nitrate fertilizers. So the versatility, I mean, our approach is fairly versatile because we can range from uh, direct soil application, producing both fertilizer or using nitric acid as a pH control. Or also we can use our uh, nitric acid as an input material, using it as a base for producing other fertilizer. Today I will be speaking about calcium nitrate because calcium nitrate is uh, the product that we are uh, currently working on in nitricity. We produce calcium nitrate 8. Uh, known in the Central Valley of California as CN8. And uh, we can also convert our uh, nitric acid for industrial uses, for instance, for uh, reactive for the mining industry. I also wanted to show you, you know, nitricity was found in 2018, as I was mentioning before, but nitricity is growing very fast. Here you can see some of the main projects uh, that, you know, have been carried on along those years, but I want to focus on the project that you can see listed here in 2022 with uh, the International Fertilizer Development Center. Uh, we sent an R&D system to the IFDC in Massachusetts, Alabama for a joint research project. And uh, also during the year 2023, we are collaborating with Elemental Accelerator and Olam Food Ingredients. We are producing some nitrogen for uh, a field trial with uh, Olam Food Ingredients coming next year. And um, then I want to talk about our, uh, you know, our calcium nitrate. I was mentioning that from a merciological and chemical standpoint, the calcium nitrate is, uh, you know, something very similar to the calcium nitrate you are currently seeing in the market. However, the production process is what characterizes nitricity and our technology. And um, I wanted to show you, however, a couple of scientific examples of the effectivity of calcium nitrate in um, you know, improving crop production and crop quality. And also I wanted to show you uh, a trial that we carried out in collaboration with IFDC. You know, uh, the scientific examples I will be showing you uh, right after are uh, examples that are taken from scientific literature and you have the source at the bottom of the slides. Let's talk about calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate is, um, you know, we believe it's a wonderful product uh, from two standpoints, right? From an agronomic standpoint, because the nitrates are plant ready to use. 
So we are giving a form of nitrogen that is optimized for, uh, for the plants and for the field. And um, nitrates can be easily and fast uh, uptaken by the plants and uh, you know, ready to be incorporated into the plant metabolism. Also, nitrates uh, don't have a, do not have a detrimental effect on soil pH. Uh, this is something that uh, you know, we see using, uh, for instance, ammonium-based fertilizers that need to be oxidized by the uh, soil microbioma. And, and this leads to an acidification of the soil, which can be more or less impactful depending on uh, the geography, but this definitely, as I will show you in the coming study, in certain environments can be very detrimental. And finally, also the calcium nitrate is uh, an important source of calcium. Calcium nitrate contains 12% of um, calcium. If we think about CAN17, which is a fertilizer that is fairly used in the Central Valley of California, we are around 8%. So our calcium nitrate 8 is uh, a significant, you know, it's an important source of calcium. From an environmental perspective, then, uh, as I was mentioning, the um, uh, our climate smart fertilizers are, um, you know, lead to a decrease and to emission when compared with urea or ammonium-based fertilizers. And the reason for that is that, as I mentioned before, uh, nitrate fertilizers don't need to be uh, converted li like it happened from ammonia, ammonium to uh, nitrates, which naturally leads to a certain emission of N2O. Also, there is no ammonia volatilization and uh, the supply chain of our fertilizer is localized and resilient because we can produce fertilizer uh, close, to the, close to the fields, close to the application sites. And now I wanted to move on with the first study uh, taken from literature that shows you the, um, you know, it's a trial carried down on Valencia Orange on a multi soil, so a soil that is uh, fairly washed with rains and tend to have uh, a low pH. The study is realized uh, with a completely randomized block design with full replication. And we tried, um, I mean, and the authors tried two different doses of calcium nitrate uh, or ammonium nitrate. The doses were uh, slightly increasing, we will see uh, what this led to. The trials was done on young plants, three to four years old uh, at the beginning of the trial, but the data was collected for eight years. So I will show you the results of a pretty long study. And here you can see the first result of the study. Um, so you can see that the calcium nitrate increased significantly production at all rates of application. And uh, the ammonium nitrate instead, uh, you know, at a maximum in terms of output produced by the plants at 214 pounds of nitrogen an acre the doses. And after that, there was a slight decrease in production. The reason for that is that, as I was mentioning before, uh, products that are ammonium-based fertilizer lead to soil acidification. And in, in this uh, specific soil, the effect was very detrimental for the production. This is the reason why, instead using calcium nitrate, which also provide a very valuable source of calcium, the plant productivity uh, you know, stayed very high at all rates and seems to be you know, indicating also that uh, even trying the, cal the calcium nitrate treatment at an increased doses might lead to uh, you know, a further increase in production. Obviously, there is some ROI calculation to be done about that, but the results are pretty insightful on the quality of the calcium nitrate. Also, in terms of uh, nitrogen use efficiency, so quantity that the uh, plant can produce once the fertilizer is supplied, we can see that calcium nitrate is definitely a um, more effective form of nitrogen. We can see these at every rate, of course, increasing the rate, we can see that the nitrogen use efficiency decreases. This is normal uh, because the plants have more nitrogen. But again, we can see that uh, calcium nitrate granted a better nitrogen use efficiency um, regardless of the doses that uh, was tried to. And this again is related to an improved soil acidification, reduced soil acidification, and improved calcium nutrition. Also, I wanted to show you another trial. Uh, this time, this was done in the US, in Wisconsin, uh, on Russell Park Bank uh, potato. The soil was a, a loamy sand soil, typical from the Wisconsin plain, pH around six. The experiment was arranged again 
uh, in a completely randomized plot design with five replication. And the um, fertilization treatment was split in three times. Uh, was given a starter fertilizer, a, a post-emergent fertilizer as ammonium nitrate, and uh, were top dress additionally additional 123 pounds of nitrogen an acre as one shot of ammonium nitrate uh, at healing or four split application of fertilizer. You can see the fertilizer listed here uh, each second week after healing. And let's move on to the result uh, where we can see that um, again, the yield in tons of acre wasn't really you know, modified or uh, didn't receive a significant difference based on the nitrogen treatment. However, we can see that the internal brown spot of the potato uh, significantly decreased in all the treatment that had a soluble source of calcium. So we can see that uh, you know, in uh, all products that, uh, all fertilizer treatments that are containing calcium chloride, including the one with urea, and of course on the calcium nitrate, um, the calcium content of the tubers was significantly increased, and this led to a better conservation quality, so a reduction in internal brown spot, which is directly tied to the pricing of uh, you know, what comes out of our field, because if the agronomic quality is higher, uh, we can have uh, a significantly return of investment. And then I wanted to show you the results of uh, our experiment that uh, we carried out in uh, Master Schulz, Alabama. The experiment was done in collaboration with the International Fertilizer Development Center. Uh, we sent to them a containerized system that you can see in the first picture here on the left. The, the fertilizer were tried uh, you know, with a soil emission testing system that is named Picaro G2508. And uh, on the right, you can see the dam that supplies hydroelectric power because, um, you know, for us, environmental sustainability is very important. And also during this experiment, we uh, made sure to use, uh, you know, hydroelectric power to run our system. And uh, here you can see the objective of the, of the trial. So the objective were to uh, produce and ship to Master Schultz Alabama a containerized production system. And this was done during the summer 2022. Then we ran uh, some production producing some calcium nitrate. And then we did some end tool study. Uh, the end tool study were done in uh, January and in March, as I will show you here. As a setup, uh, we have used these uh, Picaro chambers that were uh, you know, fertilized was used about eight kilos, so around 17 pounds of soil was used for this experiment. And then we locked the chamber and uh, we connected to the Picaro equipment that uh, you know, measure in real time the end wall emissions throughout the trial. As a fertilizer, we have used uh, a urea treatment and nitricity calcium nitrate, both at 180 pounds of nitrogen in hectare, in hectare. This was uh, uh, you know, representing an average quantity of nitrogen fertilizer supplied. And as a moisture content, we worked at approximately 60% of the water uh, available water capacity. The reason for that is that uh, the soil moisture content has a significant influence on soil and to emission. And we wanted to create representative study that are representing you know, an average condition. And we ran this trial using two different soils. One soil that was coming from uh, Minnesota, uh, pH 579, sandy loam, and the trial lasted for 35 days. And then we ran a second trial to further verify the results and also trying with, uh, you know, another soil to see how the behavior was. And, you know, for this trial, we used uh, an Alabama soil, pH 6.2, uh, the soil is clay loam, and uh, the trial lasted for 53 days because the soil was releasing N2 emission farther down the line. We interrupted the trial once we have seen that the N2 emission were uh, approximately zero. So those that I'm showing you here are preliminary results. And um, in both uh, bar charts, you can see the cumulative average soil N2 emissions that are coming from the fertilizer application. Um, in the January 2020 trial, we can see that there was a, you know, an important production, a more important production of N2 emissions above the baseline given by the urea treatment. 
But we can see that in the Alabama soil, so the second experiment, these uh, N2O emissions were uh, even higher than the previous trial. The reason for that is probably related to the soil characteristics. So we are further investigating that. And as I will be mentioning in the you know, looking ahead slide, we will look forward to do more studies about this topic. So concluding, uh, you know, the slides that I've shown you about calcium nitrate and uh, nitricity's process, um, nitricity produces uh, an electrified, you know, can produce fertilizer with an electrified system. So we just need uh, electric energy that come from clean, uh, clean systems, so clean energy. Uh, we can distribute the um, production of fertilizer and uh, our fertilizer is also more optimized for the farmer and uh, the field rather than for freight and uh, factories. In terms of the climate benefit of calcium nitrate, um, the nitrate form of nitrogen is a readily available source of nitrogen for the plants. Over time, it decreases soil acidification, uh, as we have seen in this, uh, in this trial. And also, uh, the content of calcium or calcium nitrate is uh, higher, even more than CAN17. So calcium nitrate is a very important source of calcium to supply to our plants. And also, I wanted to launch uh, a survey and give you a minute for uh, you know, answering the question about uh, you know, what you already knew and uh, you know, what, uh, what was presented today, uh, if you would like to show your uh, perspective on calcium nitrate. We will definitely appreciate that. Amy, would you be able to launch the... Yes, let me go ahead and go to the poll. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much for that, Amy. So here we are asking a couple of questions. Uh, you know, considering the environmental and agronomic benefits of calcium nitrate, that, uh, you know, I've shown you a couple of studies about that done by, you know, in published international uh, peer review research. Would you consider switching uh, or increasing your current use of calcium nitrate uh, if this was available at a lower price compared with what you are currently using today? And then the second question is related to, you know, what prevents you to use more calcium nitrate uh, in your fertilizer program? We would really appreciate your perspective on that. Wanted to give you all another few seconds to complete the poll. All right, seeing that, uh, you know, you're all participating to that, I appreciate that. Yeah, another 30 seconds and then we can move with the presentation. I see that just about half of you are, uh, you know, answering to the poll. So if you'll be so kind to answer the question, I'll appreciate that. All right, I believe it's time to close the poll. All right, one more. So I'll leave you another two seconds. All right, so I'm sharing the results with you. Um, thank you so much for your uh, for your answer. I see that uh, you know um, a, a good chunk of you will switch uh, or increase if the price of the fertilizer for cheaper. This is a very uh, this is a very interesting question. This is a very interesting answer. So uh, you know about the benefits of calcium nitrate. And uh, you do not know enough about it, but I will be happy. I will share you. Uh, I will share with you my contact information. Feel free to contact myself or any other team member in Nitricity, and uh, you know we can talk more about calcium nitrate and uh, the importance of calcium nitrate in agriculture. And then I wanted to share with you last slide. Uh, looking ahead. We are uh, partnering with uh, Olam Food Ingredients, uh, the Elemental Accelerator and the Madera Chauchila Resource Conservation District on uh, a much larger project 
we are going to start uh, some field trial in April, uh, in uh, March 2024. Uh, you can see in this uh, in this slide the bigger pilot system that uh, you know is currently producing nitrogen for those trials. And I want to thank you all for your attention and go ahead with the questions. So Tiziano, you have a question in the chat. What is the cost as compared to traditional nitrogen fertilizers? Yeah, this is a very is a very important question, and it's something that I wanted to um, you know eventually also move into a private conversation. But to give you a general idea, um, we want to produce uh, calcium nitrate at a competitive rate. We want to disrupt the nitrogen production market. So we want to, you know, decrease the cost of this input, this important input in agriculture. So from a commercial standpoint, we also have to scale up, uh, you know, the production, which will uh, lead to a further decrease of cost. But uh, we will be happy to answer to this question, maybe in a private conversation. We have another question. Uh, why do you compare it to ammonium nitrate? Yeah, that's a good question. I compare it to ammonium nitrate because ammonium nitrate is um, a fairly widespread source of uh, uh, nitrogen, but uh, again, it contains both a fraction of nitrate, which is uh, you know the fraction that uh, we are uh, also working on in nitricity because uh, you know nitrate fertilizer. We really believe in nitrate fertilizer, but also ammonium nitrate contains um, contains ammonium, and as I was mentioning before. Uh, our fertilizer contain calcium uh, and nitrate, and these two elements we believe that uh, can give uh, you know much better agronomic results. So that's the reason for that. Also, in the end tool study, I compared you know we compared the calcium nitrate with uh, urea, which is another widespread fertilizer, and uh, you know you have seen the results for yourself. Okay, we have one one more question in the chat, but it looks sure. like Zach is Zach is answering it. Um, so if anybody has any additional questions, if you want to type them in the Q and A or raise your hand as well, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we can move on to yeah the next presenter. Oh. There's no. I want to. Oh, okay. Yeah, Zach was answering. Yeah, I wanted to answer. Calcium nitrate is not a new fertilizer. As I mentioned, we are producing calcium nitrate eight, which is the fertilizer that you currently see in the market. However, the calcium nitrate that we are producing, uh, our technology allows us to produce calcium nitrate in a totally disruptive manner and uh, to save a significant chunk of uh, you know, CO2 emission. So thank you so much for the question, by the way. All right. All right, Silas. Tiziano, that was awesome. It's always neat to see new technologies that are out there. And um, I'm a farmer myself, so I'm always looking at those kind of new technologies. And it's like, hey, this might be something I'd love to play with uh, someday in the future. So yeah, I'd look of forward course. to seeing how that... I would love to get a field trip out there with you guys at Zach's place. So that would be Of a course, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yep. So hello, everyone. I'm uh, Silas Rosso. I'm here in Madeira. So those of you who don't know kind of a little bit about who we are as a company, um, been here since about 2004 and uh, Madeira area, Fresno area. And we service pretty much all the way down to Bakersfield up north of uh, about Sacramento area. So our main things that we focus on uh, plant nutrition, soil health, um, cover crop integrations into permanent crop systems and really looking at how do we improve overall soil health because soil is the fundamental thing that we're uh, growing crops in so we are trying to improve that in all aspects and also um, another thing that we do is uh, regenerative regenerative ag agronomy so we have a few pcas on staff that we also look at uh, holistic management how do we improve and decrease a lot of the inputs that we've traditionally done so those will be some things we'll talk about in the background. 
So, but a little bit of background of who I am and why I do all the stuff that I do. Um, I grew up in Das Palace, uh, not too far away from here. I've been in farming my whole life. Uh, used to harvest a lot of beans in this area. So black eyed beans, lima beans. Well, that's something that's no longer done as ag continues to move forward. Certain commodities can be grown in other areas uh, more cost effectively or cheaper. And those are things that have gone away. Also used to thin sugar beets. Sugar beets used to be a pretty common thing uh, out here. Those of you who know Mendota area, they used to have a pretty large uh, sugar beet plant uh, refinery out there. That's no longer here. So things change. Um, also did a lot of alfalfa growing up. You still see that around over time. I think we'll probably see that kind of decrease, but also have a background in beef cattle. Uh, went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, great place to learn, and uh, their motto is learn by doing. I kind of rephrase that. It's learn by redoing. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've gotten to learn from all of those. And uh, once I graduated from Cal Poly, uh, started managing a very large uh, dairy ranch in the Chowchilla area. So I was in charge of a lot of the logistics. And this is where my love of agriculture, I think, really uh, bloomed and became the next level. You know, growing up in it, there's a lot of things you just take for granted. Uh, you're not really aware of what the outside is like or as far as the uh, what the public's perception is all the time. Uh, once I went to school, came back, uh, that really started to open up my eyes. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was efficiency. How did I, how could I do more with less? How could I do the right things um, even better? Did that for a few years with this dairy operation, uh, really got involved in strip till, a uh, few things that uh, really, I love doing all the R&D because, uh, you know, when you're dealing with that many acres, there's little things that can make a big difference. So you can change a budget very quickly. And the whole soil system uh, really started to intrigue me. I realized that there was a tremendous amount of um, response that I was getting for doing very little practices or just the right practices. Uh, applying fertilizer didn't always mean I was going to get a certain output. And some of these things confused me. So one of the questions that I started to ask myself was, you know, if I put on you know, 100 units of nitrogen, what kind of yield response do I get in corn silage? Well, if a little bit's more good, then maybe a little bit more is better. Well, I realized that wasn't always the case. And so this world of biology really started to open up uh, what's happening in the soil. That was fascinating to me um, because it challenged me and it challenged a lot of the conventional ways of uh, things I had learned in school. Um, did that for a few years and then uh, got married, wanted to start a family with my wife. And so she was actually right next door. Her family was and they farmed almonds. So I went to work for my in-laws. Um, did that for a period of time, about a year, then they sold. And I was kind of at this crossroads. So uh, what am I going to do next in life? I've managed acreage. I've worked for my wife's family. And now I was kind of on the job market searching. And uh, I had actually been a customer of California Ag Solutions when I was managing that large ranch. And there was a lot of education that I was getting from um, California Ag Solutions. And that's what intrigued me to go to work for them and then become an owner of California Ag Solutions. And that's a long history. But the reason why I tell you all that is there's a lot of um, backing up to why I do things the way I do now. So I've got a family. And one of the things I really want to uh, make sure that I have in California agriculture is an opportunity for my kids to have the same kind of things I did growing up. I think if I do nothing, and if all of us on this uh, webinar do nothing with the knowledge that we have, then we will just continue to lose opportunity here in California. I think California is one of the most productive, most amazing places to do agriculture in the world. Um, I've gotten to see a lot of other places in the world, and I have great respect for it. But when I see California's environment, um, not just political, but the temperature, the just the climate is amazing. So I want to make sure that my kids have opportunity and also other future generations, even beyond them. So that's why we do what we do, or I do what I do. And then from a company perspective, um, I've really started to see this is about people. So this is a bunch of people that we employ. Um, and it's fun to see their families, their impact, and the passions that they have and why they're so passionate about uh, making changes in agriculture. Some of them have had no ag background and some of them have a lot of ag background, but the one thing that they all care about is helping other people. And I think when we start to learn some of these new technologies 
we really want to improve uh, growers' uh, response and their results that they're getting. So that's a little bit of background there. Um, kind of jumping into the main part of the talk is going to be fertigation. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar with fertigation, just a real simple definition, it's putting fertilizer through irrigation water, whether that's drip lines, micro sprinklers, it's just combining the two processes together. Um, one of the things that I have done, so managing large acreage and even small acreage and farming on my own, uh, there are two very distinct differences in how I would look at um, fertigation. You can be extremely precise, but have horrible timing as far as the crop application, and you really don't have that much of a great um, outcome. Or you can be extremely accurate on the timing, but do it all wrong. Put it in the wrong time of the set, put it the wrong concentration, the wrong product. So the reason why I put this uh, little picture up here is I think it's important to not just have precision, but also accuracy. And the two are very different. But when combined together, it makes a huge difference. And that's some of the things that, you know, looking at what uh, Tiziano was talking about, with just the different nutrients and the timing of application. Um, those are some things as an agronomist for myself, I really get excited about because these are new tools that I can use. So can I hit the target even better than what I've had in the past um, for more cost effective manner? So these are these things are very you know intriguing to me. Um those of you who aren't real familiar with um, drip systems and what we're talking about as far as injecting fertilizer in, um, you can kind of see where my cursor is. This picture just depicts, you know, injecting fertilizer pre-filters. There are certain situations where we do post-filters where we're injecting fertilizer. And it doesn't have to be just nitrogen. It can be a myriad of different types of uh, nutrients, biologicals, different inoculants, all kinds of different things you can put in through the water. And so as an agronomist, I'm looking at all of these little different issues um, that we have with a drip system, uh, the timing, the environment, and that's where I get into the four R's. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably seen this picture or know the four R's uh, extremely well. But one of the things that I think that's important and it's constantly evolving and getting better and better is understanding the tools that we have in our toolbox as making recommendations. Um, and often from a manager's perspective, uh, timing is everything, right? And that's one of the most difficult things to manage. And that's the resource that we have the most scarce of is there might not be enough guys to get the job done. There might not be enough uh, resources to get it done on time. So we might be pushed back late. Well, if we miss certain crop growth stages with certain nutrients. Well, that can kind of be a waste, right? And this is a lot of things that we're looking at is all about timing the right application, uh, the type, right placement, uh, especially with irrigation systems. I think it's important. And there's things that I see on a daily basis where we have all great intentions. The timing's good, but the irrigation system might have some major issues. So I think that's one of the things that I look at is there's always detail in every area that you look. And that's things that we enjoy uh, being able to help people get uh, things dialed in just right. Um, and I think one of the other things I wanted to kind of talk about is fertigation is a great tool that we use on a very consistent basis. Um, I would say majority of all of our irrigation in the Central Valley, we are fertigating. There are some applications that we're not, uh, where we are either uh, dry injection or dry application, like urea flying it on, or even um, liquid injection uh, with a side dress bar or um, being able to spread in different situations. So there's quite a bit, but I'd say fertigation, a lot of these permanent crops where we have drip systems, that is the primary source of getting a lot of nutrients. Um, the reason why I put this up, and if you look to that whole side, there's all kinds of, you know, the problem of nitrate contamination in drinking water. And that's a big problem we have in the Valley. Um, I live close to uh, feedlots out in the country where, yeah, my water has high nitrates in it. I drink bottled water. I have an RO system. I have all the, I'm not drinking it straight out of the tap, right? And so unfortunately there's been some issues in the past and even currently that we're, you know, degrading our water quality. And so even if we try our best, and we do a lot of the right technology, we're still dealing with problems, whether from the past or even currently um, that's in the water supply that 
uh, isn't from ag related, but we have poor water quality. And I think one of the things that we in the ag industry really need to improve on is how do we tell our story with what we're doing? And I think fertigation is a tool that we can help um, society see that, hey, here's some technology that we are doing, uh, implementing and making some improvements. So this is how we can improve and reduce nitrate leaching, volatization. And those are some things we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, but those are big deals, right? Our social license. What does society um, see that we're doing? And do they um, see that we're taking care of these resources or we're just um, kind of not using them? But from a grower's perspective, I know what I'm doing and it's the best, partly because I'm educated in that area. But I also try to make sure that you know I tell a good story so when people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Now, kind of switching gears, um, understanding the nitrogen cycle to save money. And also, I guess I could say add to that is make money. Um, the amount of nitrogen that we have all around us is fascinating. So when Tiziano was talking about, you know, uh, using nitrogen or getting nitrogen from atmospheric nitrogen, using the plasma like lightning and creating that, that's very interesting because the amount of nitrogen uh, that we get from, you know, the industrial process of Haber Bosch, it's energy intensive, takes a lot of time and resources to move it all around. If I can make nitrogen on the side of the field, that would be pretty cool. Um, so, but understanding the cycle is pretty complex. So I'm just going to kind of blow through it. My goal is not to, you know, redo the entire nitrogen cycle so everybody can uh, understand every single amount. More of my goal with this presentation is what are the things that we as farm managers, we as um, agronomists can improve on and how do we bring nitrogen into plant available and how do we prevent losing it, right? Because it is a val valuable commodity to us. So we're going to go through each one of these pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to spend a little detail. If you guys want to have questions, great. I can answer those in the back um, or at the back, the end of the presentation. So just real quick fixation. Um, one of the most, I'll be honest, this has probably become my favorite part of the uh, nitrogen cycle, if there is such a thing, but the bacteria fixation. As I have gone down this path, of uh, understanding biology, the power that microbes, fungi, bacteria, all of these different living organisms have uh, has been amazing. The more I learn about it, the more I realize I don't know as much as I thought. And I think this is also a black box to the industry. We know very little about microbes in the living soil system. Um, the amount of power that they have to fix nitrogen in different forms is pretty impressive and we do a lot with cover crops which i'll talk a little bit later about and the amount of nitrogen um, changes in the soil without adding anything has been improved um, significantly things that you know you scratch your head and i ask other agronomists hey what's going on here they have no idea either but it's a black box and that's something that's interesting and i think there's a lot more research and studying being done on that one um, mineralization this one's um pretty interesting. It's just the simple process of breaking things down um, and converting it to ammonia. These are all different stages and we can kind of manage this. Um, soil temperature is huge and that's something I'm not going to go into great detail, but having the right soil temperature, the right ground cover, how do we keep soil from getting too hot? How do we keep it from getting too cold? Um, usually we don't have that problem, but it's timing, right? Um, nitrification, this is one that's similar to um, mineralization, but a completely different process in the whole stage of where we're at on what form of nitrogen it's at. Now, all of the things that are the negatives, right? So how do we prevent denitrification? As an agronomist, one of the things I see with denitrification, and this happens, unfortunately, more than we'd like, is areas where we over apply water thinking that, Hey, if I got water and especially I'll be honest, I'm on the tomato side, we push water um, in the tomato processing pretty hard at times. Um, and we can make some mistakes there as an industry, put too much water on, you can really change the oxygen content, which when you change oxygen content in the soil, that changes everything. So you can really lose a lot of nitrogen that way, unfortunately. 
Um, volatization, not putting it where you need to be um, at the right time, flying it on uh, for a rain and then not getting enough rain. Uh, you can lose quite a bit, even um, spreading different manures um, or compost that's not composted correctly even. Um, but liquid sources, we have a lot of those issues. I wouldn't say it's as bad now, but we still, I still see some of these issues and how we can prevent that, right? Making sure that, you know, the nitrogen fertilizer is where it's at and it's into moisture so where it can actually have biological processes doing its job instead of, and putting it into the plant rather than just leaving it on the surface. Um, immobilization. This is probably a big one, especially when I look at a lot of these, uh, Orchards where we're putting a huge amount of wood chips into the soil system, there's some major carbon nitrogen imbalances instantly. So we can tie a lot of things up and it just slows the whole biological process down. Uh, managing that is critical. And those are some things that, you know, I can talk to people offline, but it's a, we've got some pretty amazing things that we do and just natural processes, right? It's all about management time and using microbes to your advantage. But uh, one of the things I've learned is microbes will always eat first. Even when you have the plant there, microbes have to have their share of the pie, then they work um, for the plant. And if you want to go down a rabbit hole, I would highly recommend um, Google searching or even on YouTube, uh, James White, the rhizophagy cycle. That is fascinating. So anybody who loves um, to dig into things pretty deep, um, his talk on the rhizophagy cycle is pretty impressive with microbes going in and out of the root tips uh, and pretty much working for the plant um, and with the plant. Fascinating. Uh, leaching, this is probably one of our most um, easily controlled. If we're doing things right, don't apply too much water. Make sure you're not putting nitrogen on You know, before large rain events. This year, we got to have that problem. Other years, we've not had that problem with rain. So uh, it's just about planning, working with a team of agronomists, um, piece, people who understand this, um, really working together with uh, the system and understanding every aspect. I think those are some important things that I look at. So these are just some of the takeaways um, with that that I want to kind of go over real quick. But I think it's having a goal with your operation when you're um, dealing and managing nitrogen, um, making sure that you're getting it to the crop and that you're balancing both the soil microbes with the plant uptake, that there's a symbiotic relationship between them, right? The right form, the time, um, all of those little details matter. Um, and making sure that we don't have any imbalances, uh, just making sure that timing is critical. Um, the right growth stage with the right form makes a huge difference. And I think that's something that's overlooked often is people say, hey, it's nitrogen, I'll just get it out there. Uh, well, you can get it out there, but at what stage and what soil temperatures do we have? What um, microbe activity? There's a lot of little things that just have to be um, observed with that. And then the efficient nitrogen use, this is something that's important. Kind of just looking at all those examples that I talked about earlier, but soil moisture is huge. Um, soil compaction, that has a lot to do with uh, bulk density, oxygen content in the soil. That's huge. Um, accurate, precise nitrogen applications. These are just the obvious ones, but don't put more on thinking it's always good. Um, we often call those people morons. They want to put more on to hopefully help get the result better, but that doesn't always happen. So don't be a moron. Um, one of the things that we have found is uh, cover crops are an impressive tool to prevent a lot of these nitrogen losses in the cycle. So leaching, uh, volatization, um, helping keep nitrogen in the system so that as it breaks down, goes through that mineralization process, the cash crop is able to pick that up. So that's a, been a fascinating one. We have been doing that since about 2015 in permanent crops. First started doing cover crops in almonds, which is the most difficult one because we we're uh, having to have a clean harvest. Um, still have gotten uh, quite a bit of success on that year over year, getting better and better. So it's impressive. Would love to visit with anybody who's interested in that as well. And so through this whole journey of what we have seen with nitrogen and what we have seen with how powerful the system is, is it often makes me question what I have done in the past thinking I was efficient and I managed large acreage. And so naturally it was very modern farming. I love technology. 
but I would sometimes rely on some of these tools a bit too much. And I think I was more focused on being efficient rather than observing the natural ecosystems all around me um, and seeing how did nature deal with this? How was its original design intended? And when you look at most of these uh, ecosystems, say a forest, for example, um, there's never a monocrop that's in that scenario, right? You have maybe a dominant large um, tree or certain types of plants, but there's always diversity. And that's one of the things that I have really started to appreciate. Um, and I look at how natural systems naturally optimize. And so that biggest difference is, you know, efficient is doing things right and perfectly where optimization or optimizing it is doing all the right things, even if it means it might be a little bit more work, right? And I often we look at efficient like, how can we make things just super efficient and easier so we can process more? Well, that kind of makes you beg the, begs the question. It's like, well, do natural systems do this? In certain aspects, yes, but more than anything, they're optimizing the resources that they have. And as we in this area are going much more um, limited water supplies, especially in the white areas, we need to be looking at how do we cut back on certain resources or we're not cutting back, we're being told um, so how do we do a better job of growing things that we can utilizing those resources um, to the best, even if it means a little bit more work, a little bit more effort in certain areas, what's our end goal there? So pretty much done. But one of the things that I always appreciate is this quote from Mark Twain. Um, a lot of things I thought I knew that I didn't. And that's really what gets me, has gotten me into trouble, just like what he has said. So. Um, with that, that's pretty much most of it. I appreciate you guys listening to all that. So if you guys have questions or anything, I'd love to um, answer anything. Hey, Silas, you have a question in the chat. It says, why do you inject fertilizer before the sand media filters versus after? Wouldn't the filters remove some of the fertilizer? Thank you. Um, good question. A lot has to do with solubility and where are we putting the flush water? Um, some of these irrigation systems, which I can go back to real quick. So um, they don't have the, yeah, they just have the pipe going in the ground. So hopefully you guys can see this pretty accurately and you see my mouse. So injecting pre-sand media filter, making sure that you have the right solubility on that product that you're injecting is a critical, very important. Um, I've seen issues where they have plugged the filters uh, pre-sand media, and I've um, that's been a big problem. We've had to fix that. But those are issues where it was not a well-planned scenario. Uh, they didn't use the right product, the right time. Things were done incorrectly. Um, downstream, um, well, back to the flushing. So if this flush, if you guys can see this, this flush manifold, if that is going into a canal system where you would have fertilizer that's getting pumped back into that system, you can have some issues with a surface or a water district. They might have rules or regulations on that, but that depends on district. Or if you're putting it into that extra water into a uh, natural waterway, those could be some issues. So you would want to, or you'd be recapturing in that and putting that in another basin. If you're doing it downstream, you're not worrying about your flush water going back into the point source. So just depends on, you know, where that flush water is going, really. Thank you, Silas. Do we have any other questions from the attendees? And give them one more minute and then we can move on. Cool. Well, I think with that, um, next up is Zach um, Ellis. So he's going to go over some pretty cool stuff. Okay. Thank you, Silas. Thank you, Tiziano. This is, uh, it's all really good information. A lot of things that Silas just touched on, I'm going to reiterate. And, uh, you know, my my dad told me a long time ago, uh, the difference between a good farmer and a bad farmer is three days. And so he was he was uh, alluding to to timing, timing being a very 
very important thing as you get into the larger corporate farmer uh, scenarios, then timing becomes even more important. So I'm really happy that you touched on that several times. So I am Zach Ellis, Senior Director of Agronomy for Old Food Ingredients. Like I said, uh, we manage 15,000 acres, give or take, 11,000 of which is almonds, spanning from Bakersfield up to Modesto, 3,300 of which is organic. So we've got every type of irrigation system, topography, soil type, um, variety, you name it, we've got it probably the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and and we try to do the best with, with what we have. So today I'll talk about nitrogen management in perennial agroecosystems, specifically almonds. Let's see. Oh, wait, okay, there we go. Uh, and here's a, a brief outline. We'll talk about some sampling methodology, critical values, a bit into dynamics into mature almonds and, and where the nitrogen goes and how it gets used. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about those four R's. So I'm glad Silas talked about them initially. And then we'll get into why the right source in that four R's component is uh, that, you know, the traditional ways have changed a bit and, and we have a new way or new perspective of looking at the right source. Um, and that that really bleeds into uh, almond life cycle assessment and, and nitrogen footprint. So uh, getting into sampling methodology. So what do we do? We we uh, sample tissues and leaves in the in the trees. We've been told that if we sample, you know, four to seven foot, about head height, um, non-fruiting spurs during certain periods of the time of the year, uh, we get the samples, we take them to the lab, and then we look at these different critical values. Now, what do these critical values tell us? These critical values tell us where those marginal and adequate zones are. So it's, it's really the point of diminishing returns. Uh, again, I love the the moron uh, analogy because I'm probably going to use that a lot, uh, uh, for, at least for that context, that, you know, putting moron does not necessarily mean that you're going to get better results. And so what we're looking for is that adequate zone, that zone where we know we have enough to be sufficient for production or what we think our production can can get to our yield potential. Uh, but we're not putting moron for a couple of reasons, uh, one of which we don't want to waste money. We don't like um, putting money down the drain, but also we don't like putting nitrogen down the drain because we have water issues and, and, and leaching issues. So when using this, uh, we need to figure out like, what does it tell us? What are those actionable items that we can use and, and take home with, uh, with tissue analysis? Now, variability is a thing. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of research with Davis and the Almond Board and the USDA and a bunch of other people we've done internally. Uh, where we've made yield maps. And you can see on this map on the right, there's a yield map um, uh, in an almond orchard. And we take different tissue samples throughout that that uh, uh, map of, of varying yields. And so if you look at it and you're looking for an average, you know, which is really the the traditional way of, of looking at tissues is you take a composite, right? You take an average of all those tissues that you've you've gotten in that irrigation set or that field or wh wherever that zone is. So let's say 2.4% is your required uh, amount in July. You get a, a field average of 2.4%. Of you think, okay, well, I guess I'm good. I've got all the nitrogen I need. That's incorrect. So by definition, uh, with an average, you're two standard deviations away from being to that 2.4%. So 50% of the field is considered deficient. So how how do we get away from you know trying to take everyone's blood pressure in the room and say that's everyone's blood pressure to understanding uh, the nuance within a field and and creating zones that we can sample uh, correctly and smartly and and then get that information and do something about it well there's a lot of technology out there um you know one of the cool and and cruel things that I have to deal with at OFI is uh, vetting a lot of ag tech. I get phone calls every day and um, there's always something new that to be sold and there's always some new technology and it's breakthrough and it's you know earth shattering and yada, yada, yada. Um, we try to be uh, really um, focused on problems that we have in the field and looking for solutions to those, to those problems. So a lot of these sensors are really great. You know, there's, there's there's ways that you can use these in-field sensors and remote sensors, remote sensing technology to get an idea of the variability within the field. But there's a few things that you have to really consider. One is location, 
So when you have these fixed sensors that you're deploying in the field, you really need to understand where you're putting them and, and what that represents. There's also a matter of granularity, right? So if I put a sensor on every tree, is that going to help me make any decisions? Because is my management capability as granular as my, my, uh, my measurement capability? And so we really need to understand, you know, how well we can manage versus how well we can measure or how well we can, we can uh, uh, match that measurement as well as those cost constraints uh, that are associated with, with all that stuff in the field, right? Uh, the third point, which is something that I think a lot of uh, ag tech companies don't really take into consideration as, as much or weighted as much is user interface, right? I mean, if I can look at it and use it and, and, and understand it, that's one thing, but I need my ranch managers, I need my foremen, I need my irrigators to sometimes understand these things and, and interface with them uh, within, uh, you know, their, their orchards. So understanding that user interface needs to be universal, it needs to be intuitive, it needs to be something that all people can utilize uh, is very important. So we want to utilize uh, some of this in orchard remote sensing data as well. Uh, and, you know, looking at all the different information that's been gathered, there's a ton of different models and uh, response curves and, and measurements and things that have been done at the UC and, and for good reason, right? They've listened to growers, they understand the issues and they're really trying to effectively make ways of modeling crop and nutrient and water demand, uh, understanding phenology of the crop better for growers. Uh, and, and a lot of these things that, you know, Olam has taken uh, part, participation in and, and has seen actionable items come out of them but it's really understanding how we can utilize them together, how we can stack them in a meaningful way and how we can make them intuitive for growers so that it's not rocket science to use these things. Um, you know, but with all these different models, we always go back to this anonymous grower perspective for any high value crop when in doubt, your best option is just to simply apply more nutrients, right? Um, something that I think earlier on in my career, I, I kind of, uh, fell into that as well. I thought, well, maybe if I give them a little more nitrogen, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll it'll be my insurance policy to make sure that that uh, my boss can't say that I'm not putting enough nitrogen on, right? Um, a very novice way of looking at things. And, and uh, during times when uh, inputs are expensive and, and our output, specifically almonds, is very cheap, we really need to understand uh, a little bit more about efficiency. So what do we do? We utilize remote sensing and then infield sensors to, to look at variability and create management zones. So the first thing that we do is we get satellite images or fixed wing or drone images, depending on, on what vendor you want to use and how granular you want to get. Um, and, and really depends on the crop. But for us in almonds, we're looking at different management zones based on vegetative index. And so the first one is NDVI. NDVI is very common. It's a universal veg index. It's basically telling you how much biomass you have out there. You know, how much how much green do you have out there on the orchard? And it does that by looking at different wavelengths. You know, there's there's UV light, which plants don't like. And then there is uh, uh, um, plant available light. So that is from 400 to 700 nanometers. And then there's near infrared. So uh, that's that's 700 and beyond. So what these really smart people at UC Davis and, and elsewhere have been able to do is is create algorithms and models and calculations based on that reflectance of those light bands, of those wavelengths of light that they can gather from this hardware, these, these different near infrared cameras and thermal cameras. Um, so NDVI is one way of looking at how much vegetation you have, but we need to go a step further. It's NDRE. NDRE is the red edge, which is essentially comparing near infrared to infrared to plant available light or photosynthetically active radiation. And what that does instead of saturating, as you can see in the bottom left, when you get to a certain canopy uh, in almonds, everything looks the same because there's a lot of leaves and it's you know, multiple layers and it's just, it just looks green. Um, so we wanna measure the greenness of the green, the chlorophyll content within those leaves. You know How much chlorophyll is actually being produced as a, as a result of photosynthetic active radiation. And that's what NDRE helps us with. And so you can see with NDRE, you can see a little bit more granularity within the field versus NDVI. NDVI is great early season, tells us how the crop is leafing out, if there's problems with infrastructure, um, other things. But NDRE is really how we create these management zones. 
So then how do we use this remote sensing to guide our sampling points? So this is what we're doing currently. This isn't something that's that's a industry standard, but I wanted to share kind of what our thought process is. It's a, a little archaic, a little uh, rough right now, but we're, we're refining it every year. So what we do at first is we get those NDVI and those NDRE uh, images, and then we geolocate the value of each one of those pixels that has an, an image uh, value, and then we create a histogram with it. And so all we're doing is we're, we're stacking up all those images to, for that field, uh, regardless of where they're at, and 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 try to see, you know, what where where do they lie? Where is the good, the bad, the ugly? Um, and from there, we will get the mean, median, or mode. Um, typically, it's the mean, so it's the average, and we will create our first management zone, which is the green. And then we will take the left tail, the far left tail, which is the lower, uh, we call it low and high rent districts. So it's the the areas that aren't producing as well, that don't have as good uh, chlorophyll content or vegetative index, and we create another management zone. That's our, our low rent district. And from there, we get these different images and we create what are called smart sampling points. So we make sure that we get into areas that we know will have representative trees for those management zones. And then we just put a sampling spot there. And so now every time we go to a soil sample, we go to tissue sample, you know, when we use dendrometers, all these different sensors that we're using in the field, they're all kind of being compiled in these, these aggregated areas so that we can have a more representative understanding of what's going on in that microclimate and how that microclimate may represent the rest of the field. You know, the real question is, you know, does that represent the rest of the field? To the best of our knowledge, all we can do right now is look at chlorophyll and, and vegetation um, from a remote sensing standpoint to make management zones, but there's a lot of research, uh, including some of the research that I'm doing right now at UC Davis, that is answering the question of, you know, is a bigger, greener, more beautiful canopy or tree really indicative of higher yield or, or, or higher input or output? The next generation, and, and this is the one of the companies that we're working with, is a company called LandScan, and they have a suite of different, different sensors that they put in this probe and they have a, a little skid steer that goes out and and uses um, the aerial imagery to start sampling the soil in a very very meaningful way so there's seven sensors um, there's a, there's a penetrometer there's a water sensor there's uh, those little those little uh, windows on the side of that of that probe are actually high resolution cameras uh, there's actually a spectroscopy uh, device in there so you can do in situ or in in-field uh, nutrient analysis. Um, there's acoustics. There's a bunch of different stuff. And, you know, 10 years ago, if you gave me all this, I'd say, that's great. But, you know, what do I do with all that data? That's way too much data for me to make a decision. You're essentially confusing me more by giving me all this data. Um, but, you know, fast forward 10 years and in the world of AI, um, you know, high output modeling, machine learning, these things now can really become uh, training data for these different models or these different uh, algorithms that have been developed and, and tell us really interesting stuff. So you can kind of see some of the, the, the way, you know, uh, you know, to the left, you can see actual soil uh, and what it looks like. You can look at uh, water saturation and field capacity as it goes down the profile in situ, meaning you know, there's no soil disturbance. The, the soil is the way that it was as you're seeing it, which is a, a whole new realm. Um, then you can get into some other things like, uh, you know, uh, spectroscopy where you're looking at, at how much nitrogen or how much phosphate or how much potassium or, or calcium is in that soil as it's in the, the microbial community that it was it was supposed to be in. And if you think about soil samples now, you know, we take a soil sample from a core, we make a composite, we mix it up. When you take it to the lab, they're going to grind it up, they're going to bake it, they're going to disaggregate it, and then they're going to analyze it for different constituents. But really, that's not the full picture. It's it's really not telling you what's going on um, in the field when all those things are put together. And a really good example is when you look at research that's you know in the greenhouse or in the lab, and you try to take those research techniques and you go out to the field and you get fully different results. The reason you get different results from applied science versus basic science is because there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more variables that you have to think about 
in order to understand what's going on. So technology like this really helps us understand what's going on in those interactions. Um, with AI, we think in, in looking at those those images, we think we can start looking at like root exudates and pictures of root hairs and quantifying that and trading models on that and, and trying to understand how they relate to each other. So the golden goose for us is to do something like this. This is one of our ranches in Madera County uh, and looking at different constituents, how, you know, applying multivariate statistical analysis to all those different, you know, 1300 data points per centimeter that this thing gives us. And then understanding, you know, which ones relate, how we can utilize different inputs to help ameliorate those issues. And then what is the cost benefit of that? Is there a return on applying X amount of this product on X amount of acres for this management zone? Um, and there has to be some assumptions made, but that's where we think the future is for us is understanding the economics behind some of this agronomic data in these management zones. Uh, things that we think will take us to the next level when it comes to precision applications. So at the end of the day, what we really want are dynamics so that we can understand uh, what inputs are needed for a 5,000 pound yield versus what inputs are needed for less than 2,000 pound yield in the same area, right? If we can really change that in demand and that, that uh, you know, tailor those inputs to the output based on modeling and management zones and sensing, then it makes sense we can make a lot of money off of that or we can, you know, in lieu save a lot of money. Uh, which is also very important. So going into dynamics of nitrogen in a mature almond orchard uh, and, and yield variability, you know, there's some really good research on that Patrick Brown did, uh, it's got to be 15 years ago now, on um, how much nitrogen we should be applying. You know, he, the wonderful people at Wonderful, uh, let them essentially destroy a bunch of trees and every month they would take one of those trees, they'd pull everything out of it, they would digest the entire tree and figure out where all that nitrogen's going and understand you know, how much is in perennial structures versus annual structures and then where is that point of diminishing returns in terms of how much nitrogen you should apply. So in, in understanding dynamics, we need to also understand that from dormancy to early leaf out, there is very little nitrogen uptake. So it's, it's foolish to put a lot of nitrogen on now. Uh, because a lot of it won't be taken up um, unless you've you're one of the the lucky few that have nice lush green leaves and it's transpiring and pulling those those uh, those nitrogen inputs up. Um, most of the time from now on, there's not going to be a whole lot of nitrogen needed. There's remobilization in happening, but there's not a whole lot of of active nitrogen mining. Uptake also commences at early leaf out and is essentially complete by whole split. So you have a uh, a window of time where you need to be on the gas and you need to be applying, but you really also have a, a window of time where you don't. And I, you know, three or four years ago, we were applying nitrogen a little earlier than we, th we probably should have been, you know, uh, probably right at leaf out instead of 70% leaf out, which is really when that root flush happens and you start to get uptake of nutrients. And then we were only, we were, you know, we were cutting it off in, in, at the end of May, sometimes mid May. And that's a problem, you know, that they need nitrogen further into the season. I think the 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 fear of whole rot becomes an issue. Um, our experience has been that's more of an irrigation issue than it is a nitrogen issue. But we've seen good results and good nitrogen use efficiency by reducing and tailing off our, our rates of nitrogen as we get into that June month. And by whole split, we will be done with nitrogen because we have a lot of other things going on. We've got deficit irrigation, but uh, applying just a little bit more nitrogen um, and not more in the sense that uh, above and beyond what you need, but more in sense of taking some from in season and 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 pushing it a little bit further and, and kind of tailing it off a little bit more effectively. Uh, and then all this work culminated around the 68 pounds of nitrogen per thousand produced uh, of kernels for almonds. Um, and since nitrogen doesn't have any uh, oxygen molecules associated with it, you don't have to worry about converting from, from elemental to oxide. It's 68 true pounds. So if we look at this study, we, we could see that 440 pounds per acre is in all of the dormant perennial organs. Um, 410 are in the, the perennial organs in March. So 30 pounds has actually been remobilized. Um, in that period from about now until 
leaves are fully off the tree. And 35 pounds of that is accumulated into new perennial tissue. So, um, you know, we want to understand how variability uh, works within a field. We want to match that with precision applications. We need to supply based on yield projections, and we need to calculate that in a meaningful way and, and be uh, realistic with your yields. Um, and, and, and in my opinion, you should be looking at a three-year average as opposed to last year's yields, um, which I used to do, but uh, I think is is uh, is not giving the full picture. We like to use hyperspectral sensing uh, to, to, and soil site characterization to develop these management zones and then have smart sampling in conjunction with these management zones so we have insight to adjustments that we may be able to make. And then we can implement our 4R fertilization, which I'll get into. One thing to talk about is, you know, everyone says, yeah, this sounds great, you've got management zones, it's awesome, but, you know, you, you go back to the granularity of, of management zone needs to be matched to the granularity of application. And if you have an irrigation set that's all across the field and I'm fertigating, then how am I going to change my rate, right? Especially in nitrogen. So that's a, that's a hard question. Um, you know, in some senses, adding a valve somewhere, changing a set a little bit can make a difference if you can see those, those huge changes in management zones but also having more of a baseline uh, application where you know, we have two management zones and they're not way too far off. We'll do a baseline that will be sufficient for, the, for both management zones, but then in the areas that have more or that need more, we'll go in with either a foliar application, a uh, variable rate, or we can do um, some soil applied, ammonium sulfate, or uh, we can use a Johnny Blue rig and go in there and do some variable rate. So there's ways to get around that. It's not as easy as having a, a, an irrigation system that could do that for you. But we've found four or five different solutions now that give us that capability. Is there more, more effort needed? Is there more labor needed? Yes. Is the juice worth the squeeze? I guarantee it is. So then we'll get into these four R's, um, which Silas had talked about before. I actually have the same exact image, which is awesome. Uh, so right rate, place, time source so we get into the right rate we talked about it here's another graph from that study looking at perennial versus annual applications and basing it on phenology right the phenology of the crop below it's not a date it's it's what's happening to that crop based on growing degree days and chill portions and and you know wind and rain and all these different things that's what really affects when you should be applying your nitrogen not a calendar date it's a good guide. It's a good for budgeting. It's good to give you uh, some some supply chain and procurement uh, prompts on when you should have your nitrogen ready. You should not be applying it until you know that that tree is hitting that state phenologically. Uh, you also need to consider distribution uniformity of your irrigation system. And Silas had talked about that already a bit, but I think it's really important to to make sure that you're uh, you're understanding, you know, how well your DU is within the field and measuring that so that you can understand um, how effic efficiently you're, you're deploying the, those nutrients uh, with nitrogen being one of them. We get into timing. So again, dormancy, bloom, leaf out, hole split, kernel fill, all these different things are not based on the calendar, uh, especially with the climate being funky this year was way different than last year. Uh, and, and I guarantee will be different in, in future years. So We've got to get away from some of these calendar applications. We really need to understand, um, you know, the phenology of the crop. And, and like I said, timing is, is so critical. So then what we've also done is we've increased the frequency and reduced the, the rate of application in both uh, irrigation and in, in, in fertilizers. So I don't mean reducing the total rate. We can keep the total rate the same, but if we have more opportunities to fertigate because we're irrigating more often in the week, then we should take advantage of those and spoon feed, spoon feed the, the nitrogen in a, in a way that, that we know nitrogen use efficiency will go up. So now for us, we've gotten away from 24, 36, 48 hour irrigations. We do 12 hours max. Most of the time we're doing six or eight hours and we're irrigating every day when it's hot, uh, every other day when it's hot, uh, depending on the, the, um, capabilities of the irrigation system, how many sets it is and how long it takes you to get around the, the orchard. But, you know, um, in every case, in every ranch, with every different circumstance, 
anytime that we're spreading the water out through the week better and we're increasing the amount of uh, frequency of fertigations, we have a better result. Placement. So um, just as I talked about increasing the frequency of fertigation, when you do that, you're not pushing water too far down the root zone. And there's a lot of good research that's already showing, uh, you know, all of your roots, most of your roots that are fine and that are taking up water and nutrients and all the things that we want are in the first 18 inches of the soil. And a lot of that has to do with the soil microbiome, like Silas was talking about. Uh, there's a lot of research going on on that where, you know, we've we've done a lot of uh, shot, shallow shotgun metagenomic sequencing um, where we look at the DNA markers of different um uh, microbiome or microorganisms, and then we can see those functional groups within uh, the community of microbiome and, and understand where they reside. And it's in the first 18 inches of the soil. So uh, if you're making big applications of water and you're putting big applications of nitrogen, you are most certainly wasting time and money. What you should be thinking about is how you can spread the water out, how you can spread the irrigation uh, or the fertigation rather over the week so that you can have a more efficient usage of that and keep your, your wetting zone shallow within that 18 inches. And then, you know, depending on how, you know, how uh, innovative you want to get or progressive you want to get with your irrigations, uh, you know, for us, we're not irrigating more than 12 hours and, and my branch managers have to wait at least 12 hours to irrigate again. So they have some constraints and they know that they have to get into those those uh, uh, fertigations and irrigations aggressively in order to, to hit their weekly needs. Um, but, you know, if, if you're going in with a five horsepower engine and a 500 gallon bubble, and you're just pushing the nitrogen in, then you really need to understand um, placement in terms of when you're applying the nitrogen within the irrigation set, right? If I apply it all at the beginning or the middle of that irrigation set and it's 24 hours, there's a high likelihood, depending on the soil, that I will probably push a lot of that nutrition past the root zone or past that 18 inches. If I'm using a mazy uh, or Venturi system and I'm slow feeding it over six hours and my irrigation total is eight hours, then I know that I'm spoon feeding that in a, in a way that will help those trees and that microbiome absorb and, and process those nutrients that we're getting so that they can maximize their production. And subsequently, we maximize our production. So back to source, we talk about our traditional perspective. You know, there's some good research from IPNI that looks at different types of, of fertilizer and, and Tiziano uh, hit on this very eloquently, you know, talking about ammonium sulfate versus urea versus calcium nitrate. You can see here that the traditional way calcium nitrate can move in the soil a little bit easier than some of the other um, positive cation type products like uh, ammonium or, or even urea. So we have to be uh, cognizant of that. Again, when you spread your irrigations out and you spread your fertigations out, um, you can really uh, overcome a lot of this. But you want to match your strategy with your, with your source, and you really want to understand how those sources should be considered. So Again, if you've got a low pH soil, you probably don't want to put a whole lot of ammonium-based fertilizer on. Um, if if you've got, you know, a really a really heavy soil, then maybe you can get away with a little longer of an irrigation. Um, it's all very site specific, but things that need to be put in perspective. But now I challenge you to look at it in a new perspective. So right source for us has always been, you know, UN32 versus CAN17 versus CN9, right? But with a new lens. We're looking at life cycle assessment of almonds and carbon footprint of almonds, and that has become very important. Uh, and and not so much for me. I mean, honestly, it's important to me now, but it wasn't important to me, you know, five years ago. I was more worried about uh, the agronomic components, which is important. But uh, our customers, you know, big customers, the General Mills of the world, the the Mars of the world, the Kind Bars of the world, their customers are coming to them and saying, we care about where you source your products. We care about your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And because of that, a lot of these CPG companies, these, these consumer packaged good companies have come and said, hey, if you can show us a way that you're reducing your footprint or you're sequestering carbon, and we can measure that and meaningful, meaningfully articulate that to our customers, then we will do 
a lot of things. We'll either fund projects, we'll give you a premium per pound of nuts, we'll go into long-term contracts. Uh, there's a lot of things that they're willing to do. So that's that's really opened our eyes. And uh, our new perspective is is more of, of a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. And I'll start with a little bit of good news. I know we're short on time, so I'll be quick. 21% of our global human cause greenhouse gas emissions come from ag. But at the same time, they're a huge carbon sink. So you look at land produces, when, it, when we talk about land, we're talking about um, you know, all of the different uh, ag and forestry and, and other land uses, about 5.2 gigatons of CO2 a year. But it, the same sectors sequester 11.2 gigatons of CO2 a year. This is, this is globally. So that net benefit of six gigatons of CO2 a year is equivalent of the total annual emissions of the United States. So that's a big amount. And it's, you know, it, it's something that we should be proud of. I think it's something that a lot of people don't understand. And, uh, you know, my hope is that that everyone on this call and, and webinar goes out and tells as many people as they can about that, because it's, it's something that's really important. However, we get to Javon's paradox. In the long term, an increase in efficiency of a resource will generate an increase in resource consumption. Uh, and, and you know, our, our our goal is always to reduce the the usage, but we always end up using more of it if we're more efficient. So if we're going to use more nitrogen because we're becoming more efficient with it and we need to feed a, a growing population, then we really need to understand how we're making that nitrogen. And that's really where nitricity has come into play for us. Uh, it's why we're so excited about it. It's why we partner with them. It's why we're willing to to really do anything we can to to move forward this this concept. So, you know, you look at uh, some of these life cycle assessments that have been done on different perennial cropping systems, and specific to almonds, up to forty percent is in nutrient management, meaning forty percent of our total uh, carbon footprint comes from nutrient management. And up to 30% of that is manufacturing. So the Haber-Bosch process, uh, you know, moving all that stuff and using those high, high in, uh, energy intensive processes and then freighting all that stuff across the ocean uh, over here for so for we can use it is really, really intensive for almonds. And so when we look at nitricity, and I know there was a question about this before, and this is a, a, a preliminary life cycle assessment that's been done. Uh, but we look at CN8 via gray ammonium, and we look at CN8 via green ammonium with power credits. So we're 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 trying to, we I'm not, nitricity is trying to um, really take into account these different inputs and how they have different perspectives in terms of uh, emissions. But then you look at at uh, you know what nitricity can do, and you know with with solar. It's, it's, you know, one kilogram of CO2 equivalent is avoided for every uh, kilogram of nitrogen produced as calcium nitrate. Uh, and, and, you know, and that might be wrong, actually. I think it's 11. So it's one to 11, my, my fault. But if you look, uh, looking at 100% solar offset, but even if you use some of this uh, clean coal uh, technology, it gets even better. So this is really where we see the value in nitricity and what they're doing. Um, the the huge amount of of uh, greenhouse gas avoidance, the huge amount of of uh, life cycle assessment or carbon footprint reduction that we can see uh, through using products like nitricities is is astounding and unprecedented. So um, we're really excited about it. Uh, I'm always here for more questions if you have anything that you want to get into detail with. But with that, I appreciate you listening. Thank you, Zach. And if any presenters have any questions, we have a Q&A session. Um, looks like Colin has a question. Colin, I will unmute you. Yeah, hey Zach, um, I had a it's sort of a technical question about deficit of irrigation at whole split versus um, nitrogen management. Uh, I just I I hear conflicting things there. I mean, the last thing I heard was that uh, it's really the percentage of nitrogen in your petiole analysis going into whole split that's going to determine whether or not you're at risk for hole rot. 
but it sounds like you guys have seen something different. Yeah, and there's new research I can send it to you uh, that, that Patrick Brown has done that, that you know, whole split. Look, if you're going into your, you know, you, so we take April and May tissue samples, but let's say we took our May tissue sample and it was through the roof, then we would probably cut back uh, just to save some money knowing that we have enough nitrogen. But if you're just hitting those critical values in April and, and May um, and you still have some time to apply nitrogen, we we apply it all the way up until whole split and you know we're not putting 10 gallons an acre of un32 out or or you know 15 gallons of, of cn9 we're putting smaller amounts we're putting just a couple three gallons a, a week but what we've seen is no increase in in whole rot and um, as long as you're managing your irrigation correctly and uh, we also look at carbohydrate non-structural carbohydrate assimilation throughout the season um, and we've seen a, a higher uptick of non-structural carbohydrate assimilation as we provide smaller amounts of nitrogen further into June. And, and you know, that gives us time to really think about, um, you know, whole split at, at, in July and, and, and trying to do some deficit irrigation there. But, you know, our, our last application this year of nitrogen was like three gallons an acre of UAN32, and that was like the last week of June. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Do we have any other questions from the attendees? I don't see any in the Q&A chat, but if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I could unmute you. Otherwise, I think we are finished with the webinar for today. I just thank all of the presenters who presented today. To Ziano, Zach, and Silas, thank you for, for being here to present. And um, yeah, if there's no more questions, I think we're good to, to end the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rossi. And thank you for attending. Okay.